The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com Announcer session will be recorded and the video will be available on uh, uh, Reinforce UA site uh, later on and also on, on different uh, uh, platforms where Mim Kiev is present. And now I am honored to introduce you Mr. Jonathan Brill. Jonathan Brill is a speaker and advisor on resilient growth and decision making and innovation under uncertainty. He is the author of Rogue Waves, a uh, book published in 2021, and uh, his practical advice uh, uh, is based on decades of experience as an entrepreneur uh, and innovator consultant, uh, uh, and also as a member of Fortune 50 tech executives at Hugh Packard and managing partner of innovating consultancy that develop products for clients like Samsung, Microsoft, Verizon, PepsiCo, and, and even U.S. government. Uh, Spril is the managing director of the Serendipity Institute and the board advisor at Frost & Sullivan, a major market intelligence firm with offices in 46 uh, countries. He holds a degree in industrial design from Pratt Institute, spent years as a research consultant uh, to the MIT Media Lab, and in the management training at the Stanford University Graduate School Business. Uh, that's really a great pleasure, uh, uh, Mr. Brill, to have you today with us. And today's discussion uh, makes uh, people, uh, uh, sub discussion subject makes makes people uh, simultaneously exciting uh, and, and a little bit troubled. Uh, I'll speak about artificial intelligence and how to make it more exciting for business with more opportunities rather than just a uh, troublemaker. Uh, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I'm a big supporter of Ukraine and just trying to figure out how can we help reconnect the economy? How can we make things better support you from, from the outside? So I'm, I'm just grateful to be here today. Um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, just a couple of months ago, people were looking at it as an abstract thing that might happen in the future. I was just at the major SAP conference here in San Francisco. And what we discovered was um, that, that this has moved from, from theory to reality really quickly. Companies are trying to figure out what do we do with this? What's the business case? Uh, how can we implement, execute these technologies? What can we afford to do in our companies? And so in, in literally like a three month period since the end of last year, this has moved from abstract to real. And my concern is that the technology is there or at least will be there at an enterprise level in the next couple of years, but our businesses and more importantly, our cultures are not. And so what I wanna to talk to you about today is what's happening, what's how, how the rules, how the playing field is changing, and some small things that you can actually do today to prepare your organization, prepare your teams for what happens next. And the good news is the real differentiators won't be technology, they'll be people, they'll be how, how we work together as humans. With that, let me, uh, let me pull up some slides and, and we'll go through the, we'll go through some slides and, and talk about what's What's happening next? So we're all interested in AI. So some people are working on it. Some people are talking about it. A lot of people are talking about it. Even more are saying that they're working on AI, but art. The reality is that we're at a point of massive change. No one knows how to begin but we're all actually gonna have to start in the next six months, year, 18 months to figure out what this really means in our businesses. At the end of the day, AI is built on, on a concept that we call generative networks. 
We live in a world of generative networks, uh, uh, systems where, where the output is qualitatively better than the input. We see them all around us. Civilization is a generative network. Every time we've created a technology that makes it easier and better for us to share than to take, we create dramatical, dramatic increases in what's possible for humanity. And in the late 1400s, early 1500s, the printing press changed the way that we share knowledge. In the 1800s, railroads changed the way that we share goods. Over the last couple of decades, what we've seen in the age of the internet, the age of silicon, the age of the transistor, is that the internet has changed the way that we divide work. Over time, this has had massive implications for humanity. In 1800, it doesn't matter where you were. If you were in Ukraine, Uganda, the United States, the United Kingdom, the average income around the world was about $350 a year. Move forward to today, that number is radically different. What we're seeing is a world of comparative wealth for most people in the world compared to all of human history. Moving forward to, to the age of AI, the AI economy, 30 years from now, if we do projections, what we're seeing are billions of people entering the US level middle class. What we're talking about is unbelievable wealth on the planet. To get here, we're gonna to have to do some massive things. We're gonna to have to generate more change than we have in all of human history. We're going to have to somehow triple consumption while decreasing resource use. This is the biggest activity. This is the biggest project we've ever undertaken as a species. To get here, to get here in relative peace, we're going to have to do something like build 100 nuclear power plants a year. We're going to have to build 11,000 buildings a day for the next 30 years. This is the game. This is the game that we're all playing. And the level to which we get this right or the level to which we get this wrong is the level in to which we either end up in a Star Trek future, a Blade Runner future, or we'll get to this in the next session. The reality is unless we get really, really lucky and we figure out how to share our resources more effectively, we are going to have massive issues moving forward. The challenge today, the thing that is so scary today, isn't that the future is uncertain or that it's unknown. It's actually that we know a lot about it. For the first time in human history, we're able to look forward 20 years and say, if we don't make changes, we have massive problems with things like labor scarcity, uh, whatever is the next economy, geopolitical stress, governance issues, so on and so forth. And this is what we look at in my business. We look at how we overcome these issues, how we turn these trillion dollar crises into trillion dollar opportunities, how we turn businesses into generative networks, turn those generative networks into generative economies. And my team goes around the world with executives, probably like you, to understand what's really going on on the ground. Not what's on the news, but what's really happening. And so every year uh, we go and we work with startups and senior executives and mature companies to, to make these connections in places like London, Singapore, New York, Shenzhen, Kiev, Berlin, Hong Kong, San Francisco, and Dubai. And what we're discovering, what we're discovering is that people like you, every single one of us who are committed to learning, to creating a better future, we are figuring out how we're going to change the game. And if we're smart, we can step back and say, what's actually going on here and start turning these trillion dollar crises into trillion dollar opportunities. All of these crises, every single one of them, is colliding with artificial intelligence. What's clear about AI to me is that it is our greatest chance to architect our future. It's our greatest chance to, to overcome the limitations of our minds. It's the greatest chance to, to figure out how we're going to share resources more effectively. And it's simultaneously changing the way 
that we work with not knowledge, the way we work with goods, and the way that we divide labor. All three things we talked about before that massively shaped human potential in our lifetime. AI is changing the way we work with knowledge, the way we think about knowledge. Up until about three months ago, when you wanted to look at something like inflation in the United States, what would happen is that we would go and we would get the smartest economic forecasters in the world and, and they would all put their finger in the air and then we'd, we'd average out the results. That was the best thing we had. And then in January, some snotty kid at the St. Louis Fed, he, he published a paper because he had put the same questions, the same information into a large language model and discovered that it creates as good or in many cases better results than SPF, the Survey of Professional Forecasters. This suggests that, that we're going to radically change the nature of knowledge, the way we work with it, the way we create it, the way we consume it moving forward. We're also seeing dramatic shifts in the nature of goods. Google DeepMind in November published a paper, it's really stunning to me, that suggested that they had increased by 10 times the number of stable materials that we know about. And so when you think about stable materials, I'm talking about things like bronze, uh, iron, steel, silicon, right? The three things that have dramatically changed the course of human history. We increased our knowledge of what those things are we could make by 10 times in a couple of months, a couple of weeks last year. Not only that, at Lawrence Livermore Labs, literally across the bay in San Francisco, we have robots that are using AI to automatically, without a lot of human intervention, start to make these materials. What this suggests is that we're going to see a massive acceleration in scientific knowledge, technological knowledge, and that will shift the way that we make goods. It will create hopefully alternatives to, to many of the materials we use today that are going to likely cause more resource conflict moving forward. The third way that AI is dramatically changing the nature of business, changing the nature of the economy, is it's changing the nature of work. Just a couple of weeks ago, OpenAI uh, released a, a new large vision model called Sora. This model, literally when you type a sentence into it, creates that video with AI. That video did not exist. None of those people existed. None of those buildings existed. None of those lights, none of that sunset existed. That was created out of whole cloth by AI. AI also recently passed the bar exam, the, the interstate bar exam, how we, how we pass, how we suggest that lawyers, uh, attorneys, barristers in the United States um, are qualified to, to practice. It passed the bar exam. It knew how to answer all of the questions. Google DeepMind also recently published a study that said uh, for telemedicine, that doctors are, are, the AI is as good at doctors on 28 of the 32 metrics by which we measure doctors. Now, when I look at all of these things, it doesn't suggest that the doctors are going away. It doesn't suggest that lawyers are going away. It doesn't suggest that the, the visual artists are going away. What it suggests is that it's going to, to deal with everything but the edge cases that we have to deal with. I'm still going to want a doctor who's an expert to do the final diagnosis. I'm still going to want a lawyer who's an expert to say, what's the edge case here? What's another way around this that no one's thought of before? But that 80% of the work that's just figuring out what the options are, the obvious options are, that will get automated. As a result, we're moving into a world where instead of power in organizations being the, based on the number of people you control, right? If you control a thousand people, you have power in an organization. It's about the number of processes you control. In a world of AI, one person might be able to control a thousand processes. And they're going to be supported not just by people, right, but by AI lawyers, AI doctors, AI metallurgists, AI economists, AI consultants. As a result of this, 
people much lower in the organization who could never afford that kind of decision support before will be empowered with decision support and, and, and need to have executive judgment to make better decisions. Executive judgment is being pushed from the person who controls a thousand people way down into the organization in the next three to five years. We've got to figure out how we're going to restructure to take advantage of that and how we're going to enable junior people with the skills of senior people today, move them away from just doing tasks to building that executive judgment. And when, when the details aren't there and when there's a lot of uncertainty, executive intuition. Everything we seem to be talking about today, about all of these things that are changing the world, we're looking at one little corner of AI. It's called a transformer model. We've actually been dealing with AI for since about 1955. There's a huge body of work that we do that is 80% probably of the value creation that's going to happen over the next five years or so. But this new world of generative AI, of transformer models, is changing the game. I don't mean like that. Transformer models, like civilization, are generative networks. And we, they, they come in different names. We hear a lot about Gen AI. We hear a lot about large language models like OpenAI and Claude. We hear a lot about image generators, things like Midjourney, things like that video that I showed you called Sora. And we're going to see a lot more in the next couple of years about large vision models. And these are going to empower things like robotics. Transformers are generative networks. Much like other networks, they're a result of the nodes, in this case, the data in, in the network, and the edges, the relationship between that data. When you change the relationship between the nodes and the edges between the data, and, and in this case, the model, you change what's possible. You change the output from the model. When you change the relationship, you change what's possible. You change the potential. This might sound a little bit abstract, so I want to do like a, a little mental exercise with you. If I want for you to think of, of a landmark, something famous. So if you're an American, the landmark you are most likely to have thought of was the Empire State Building. The second most likely thing would be the Statue of Liberty. But if you're French, you wouldn't have thought of either of those. You wouldn't have thought about the, the Empire State Building, first of all, because you're French. But second, because it doesn't exist in France. You might have thought of the Statue of Liberty. That, that might seem like something you would think about because it was designed by a Frenchman. It was a gift of Fran from France to the United States. Uh, it was engineered by a Frenchman. In fact, the same Frenchman who uh, built the Eiffel Tower, Pierre Eiffel. But in Paris and in Lyon, there are lots of little baby uh, statues of liberty, including one right down uh, on, on the foot of the Eiffel Tower. And so you don't think of these as landmarks, they're just kind of things you walk by. When you change the model, you change the relationships, you change one little thing, like where the person's from, you change the output. We talked about the economy, we talked about civilization, we talked about AI. Business is also a generative network, it can be. And I think the core question you, we need to be asking now, we need to be asking moving forward is how are we going to use the acceleration of work, the acceleration of knowledge, the acceleration of product innovation to turn crisis into opportunity? When we talk to our HR people, they, they tell us that our, our companies are made up of people. That, that is incredibly true. But they're also made up of three other components. The architecture, what's the command? What's the control? What's the communication? Who's in charge? The second is the routines, right? You have your finance, you have your operations, you might have legal, you might have research and development function, human resources, so on, so forth, and so on. And then you have your culture. The culture 
is how we align around what happens next. When you change the relationship between architecture, routines, and culture, you change what's possible for your organization. You change the potential of your organization. You change the outputs. Let's look first at organizational architecture. Today, so many companies are going through digital transformations, trying to figure out what's going on next. Over the next seven years or so, all of us are going to have to rethink this in a very deep way because the old technologies aren't going to be read, aren't going to be capable of supporting the new technologies. The, the old ways of working aren't going to be capable of supporting the new ways of working. Whenever we transform our organizations, we're trying to get back, kind of get back to the start, like how much fun it was at the beginning when, when maybe it was three people, maybe you had a, a CEO, maybe you had a CTO, you know, and maybe you had a finance guy or ops person over here, and you were all out just having a good time figuring out how to build this thing. And then, and then you had to actually build it and you had to actually start innovating, get past the, the initial idea. And then, then, then you had to have like six, six or eight people in your organization. That's about the most innovative structure you can have. So you have three people, that's the most efficient structure. You have six to eight people, that's the most innovative structure. A little more connectivity between those people creates a little more friction. But then you've got to scale, then you've got to do something. And pretty soon you've got more spaghetti where you've got more spaghetti than meatballs. You suffer from the meatball conundrum. Anytime you get past about 12 people that anybody's reporting on. The question we ask when we go through digital transformations, when we think about how to make our teams more innovative, more efficient, is how, is how, to, to, how to solve the meatball conundrum. And, and AI is gonna be really important to this. Because what it does is it, it takes all of that mess, all of that unstructured data, all of that unstructured communication, and it's going to start to help us figure out how to get just the right information to just the right person, the right place at the right time. So even though you might be 100 people, you might be 1,000 people, you might be 10,000 people, no one's listening to 10,000 like ch channels of babble, 10,000 channels of email, 10,000 channels of chat, 10,000 channels of meetings, they're just getting the snippets that are important to us. Let me give you an example of this. I was doing an AI strategy project for a Fortune 1000 company, a manufacturer. And we'd gone and we'd talked to all of the, the, the top AI experts in the world. We had 30 hours, 25 hours of, of recordings of them. We had uh, done internal Zoom meetings and interviews with experts, people across the organization. We'd then done a half-day workshop with the C-suite of the company. And what I, what I realized when we got through with this is what they really needed was a report that they could share out what the learnings were. But that wasn't in the deliverable set. That wasn't what was initially negotiated. And I knew that writing that would take me probably 100 hours to really get right. But then I thought about what do we have here? We, we have transcripts from AI driven transcripts from all of the, the conversations we've had. We, we have video from the, the workshop. We have, uh, we have the, the, the annual reports of this company. We have all of the analyst information. I put all of that in a large language model and I started querying it. And three hours later, I had about an eight page report that was really crisp, really tight. I went from something that would have taken me 100 hours in December to something that took me three hours in February. Massive shifts in efficiency. And it was a result of my ability to query all of the information from my organization, all of the information from meetings I hadn't been in, and get it tight, get it right, get it to be exactly what this client wanted. I explained what had happened to them, and they were really impressed. They said, maybe this is the actually the best strategy report we've received. That becomes possible for almost everybody in your organization if you start sharing information across your organization. As a result, you don't necessarily need 
you know, people like me to come in and do all of this work. Many of your people can do it themselves. This is going to be a massive shift in the world of AI. It's not only uh, improving executive judgment by creating decision support, it's changing communication, it's changing coordination across the firm. We did a time task analysis a couple of years back about how much efficiency gain technologies like this, technologies up to 2018 and large language models, uh, transformers had come into existence at that time. They just weren't productized yet. Uh, what we saw was that independent of cost, there was about a 40% decrease between 2018 and 2030 in terms of the, the time it would take to do the work that companies do at that time. Looking forward, uh, a couple of months ago, the International Monetary Fund, using a similar methodology, found that companies that had already started through their transformation journey, they might see a 20 to 25% gain. So if you're already going on your S4 HANA journey with SAP, if you're already going through these transformations, you're still going to see massive upside. But it might be a little bit smaller than if you were just starting off as a mom and pop business today. These efficiency gains aren't just driven by architecture and routines though. They're also driven by culture. When we think about transformations, right? Your, your average consultant, transformation consultant, they might say, say it'll take 90 days to a year. But the reality as leaders that we all know is when we uh, purchase a company, there's an M&A, it takes like a couple of years for the leadership team to get sorted out, to get the command and control sorted out, often a little longer than that. When we want to uh, change our routines and, and, and shift the way we do our supply chain and finance function through something like, like, like SAP, that process probably takes about three years, about a year to align on what needs to happen, about a year to build it. And then about a year to, to, for people to get comfortable and then fix all the stuff that didn't work. So this stuff takes time. But the thing that really takes time is culture change. If you want to have the kind of culture change that Satya Nadella did at Microsoft, that's typically a five to seven year process. It's a shift over an executive staff. It's, it's leveling up people. It's creating psychological safety. It's creating comfort. It's convincing people over time that that will work. It's changing incentives. This is really important to recognize because culture doesn't eat strategy for lunch. It eats transformations. And so looking out to 2030, if we want to have this kind of shift, and we are going to need to make radical shifts to get these advantages in our firms, we need to be thinking about that culture shift today so that we can be prepared for these technologies as they start to come online. We're moving into this world where one person might be building or working with a thousand processes. That culture change needs to start now. And if you're an IT leader, if you're an IT executive, you're probably going to be leading that charge. Why? Because your people are going to be the first people working with artificial intelligence in your company. In a world where, where you don't need to have high executive judgment through years of practice because bots can help you with that. In a world where, where you don't need to be networked across the world to make your organization work, because we have bots for that. What are the skills that are really important moving forward? How do we move from a world where, where we judge people or train people on executive judgment to a world where we train people on executive intuition? This is one of the things we've been looking at of what we call the strategic luck project. We studied over a thousand leaders to understand why some are dramatically successful in times of uncertainty than others. And it turns out that, that, that luck is also created, guess what? By generative networks. If you wanna have outsized luck, when you change the relationships between the people you know, the processes you have, the places you are, so on and so forth, you change what's possible. So, so how do you become lucky on purpose? 
it turns out that there are four skills, four basic skills that you can, that you can implement in your business, in your life, with your staff to dramatically increase outcomes in new situations without having any idea how to achieve success, how to get out of the current pickle. You can't always start with all four of the skills that we can build. You often have to start with one. So let's let's look at these one by one by one by one. And then I'm going to ask you a question at the end of this and, and see, see if we can find a way to help. The first and most important skill is to leverage help. Early in our careers, so many of us think we have to be the experts at everything, get everything done, do stuff without help. And then you start having success. And what you discover is that you get elevated, you're managing people, and all of a sudden you have no idea how to do this thing down here, or, or you need help from someone in a different function, someone in a different geography. So as senior leaders, these are things we, we get comfortable with. In a world with where people much earlier in their careers have much higher responsibility, have much higher contextual knowledge of what's going on in the organization, they need to be comfortable doing that so much more early in their careers. The second piece is unexpected connections. Early in careers, we, we tend to keep people in our organizations, in the processes, in the structures. In a world where our, our data lakes and so on and so forth are, are easily searchable, easily uh, uh, synthesizable by AI, what we need is our people actually not to be in the database in our organizations. We need them to be looking outside of our organizations for data, for information we don't yet know. As senior leaders, what we know, hopefully, is that when we leverage help and unexpected connections, we shift the network, we flip the network, we change what's possible for us. As a result, the inevitable thing is we've dramatically increased our potential. And the next thing that happens is that we've disrupted our fate. There's complete chaos. As senior leaders, these are the things that we know how to do. We don't get the things on, on the table that, that are about um, stuff that are easy to do, stuff we have processes for. We, we, have, we get things on our tables where there are problems. And so what we've developed are deeper skills around risk management, threat management, right? We, we look at new ways to, to control, to manage governance by doing three things, changing the timing at which things happen, changing the sequence in which things happen, or hedging risk, hedging disruption. We don't rely necessarily on standard operating procedures because the things we deal with are non-standard and standard operating procedures rarely work in non-standard times. We need to teach people these skills of deep risk management much earlier in their careers. When you become comfortable doing this, become comfortable with serendipity, what happens is you don't walk into new situations and, and experience threats and danger. You walk in and, and, and focus on what you've been told to do. What happens is that you step back for a minute and you say, okay, I know this is the goal. This is what I've been told to do. But over here, there might be a new pool of value that no one's swimming in. Over here, there might be a, a lever that no one else has pulled. And we start rethinking our processes foundationally. In a world of AI, in a world where, where AI can help us with low code, no code, uh, all of these different capabilities start to, to build processes underneath us. What we need is for our people to be comfortable in that ambiguity and not just be looking at how do we hit the quarter, how do we hit the moment, how do we hit the KPI, but also how do we find a new way to do it? How do we make sure that this is still the right goal? The goal, the jobs of senior leaders, the, the intuition of senior leaders today need to be the jobs and intuition of junior leaders tomorrow. So we live in a world of generative networks. The economy is a generative network. Our minds are generative networks. Business is a generative, generative network. This conversation, this, this conference call, this webinar can also be a generative network. And the reality is we make far more luck together than we do alone. I can make my own by working harder, being smarter, so on and so forth. But the reality is it's, it's relationships. It's someone else opening the door for us that typically really levels of, us up 
gets us at that next level of, of our potential, of our organization, of the economy. So we often can't do all of these things at once. So where do we start? I propose leveraging help, asking for help, because that's the easiest way that we have to flip the network, to let other people who might be experts at things we don't know how to do help us out. Other people who might know people we don't know to help us out. Yesterday, I was speaking at a conference. I had this guy come up on stage. His name's Kurt. He didn't know how to achieve an objective that was critical for his company. I got him up on stage. 45 seconds later, literally 50 people gave him advice, gave him connections to achieve his goal. So let's listen to this little video of him. And then we'll talk about what are the three things, what are the three critical pieces of this message that you can embed when you ask for help to dramatically increase the likelihood of people offering help and it working out. Hi, I'm Kurt with Alton Low Brink, and I'm here at this conference this year uh, on a quest. And that quest is to transform our help transform our organization from two independent companies into one global company. Uh, I'm part of a larger team, and our objective is to find partners that have had uh, a proven track record of integrating U.S. and European manufacturing operations into an HANA S4 framework. And what we're trying to do at the conference is start conversations with uh, those partners that we think meet our criteria so that we can schedule and get them in front of our senior management team. If you know of partners that may fit within our category, or if you had some experiences yourself as a company and have done it internally, how you approach some of this stuff, uh, it would be great, would great if we could share that experience together and then share that experience with everybody else that would like to know about it. So Kurt, in a minute, had 50 people reaching out to try and help him because he asked the right question in the right way. In this webinar, we have an opportunity to use the chat window to do the same things. And there were specific aspects of his ask, ask that made it more generative than just saying, hey, I need, I, I need some help with uh, some technology problem. These are what they were. First, he figured out why this is bigger than him, right? What's the bigger picture than whatever KPI I've been assigned? And then we talked for probably 45 minutes and we identified five things he was actually asking for uh, that would be really hard. They take days for someone to parse. You need a consultant to figure this stuff out. But we broke it down into five, five minute asks someone else could help him with. And together, they would create the total opportunity he needed. So he asked for a five-minute favor, something somebody could answer in five minutes with no reputational risk to themselves, and that's really important, and without a financial ask of anybody else. And that's really important as well, because you know the adage, you know, if you want money, ask for help. If you want help, ask for money. The last piece is he was really clear about what's the timeline? What will this unleash for others? As a result, he went from a, a, a place where he was wanting help to a place where he, where he was trying to help others. We all want to help people who are trying to help others who have a, a, a simple thing that they can do uh, and, and clear criteria for what success looked like. So in the chat, who got something out of today? And then let's ask the questions of yourself. What did you get out of today? And then what are you looking for? What are you looking for help with? In the process, somehow we'll flip the network. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... As a matter of fact, I understood that you touched even second subject as well, which you are going to address being in Kyiv in a couple of weeks. Uh, and therefore, for everybody who is interested in, in joining and to understanding this methodology and, and, and possibility, uh, please uh, visit uh, the website of MIM Kyiv. Uh, I'm sure there is an information about the coming event. Uh, but coming back to AI, we still have about 15 minutes uh, uh, or so for discussion. Uh, 
And um, well, I will start with the following. There is a feeling of urgency. There's a feeling that, you know, something should be done immediately. Uh, otherwise, uh, and nobody knows what, what will happen. Otherwise, or at least uh, we should lose money. Okay, investors know what to do. Investors feel flood money into in, into the big companies and they grew uh, over uh, last year and the last six months considerably. But uh, would you please comment, why is urgency? What What's going on? What company we need to start with? You mentioned that it is not a technology, there's still people which are critical and which are, are, are differentiation factor. Uh, uh, sh should we be in a hurry actually? Apple seems not to be in a hurry very much uh, at the moment, um, but it's not growing on on, on the stock market. Uh, probably it's not uh, relevant to, to copy the Apple, but what's going on? Why urgency? What so, would you so, comment? So Apple is very busy. By the way, John Gian Andrea, who's the, the head of AI at Apple, very, very busy man right now. Uh, they're using a different approach uh, to, to AI that's much more about what's called federated machine learning or federated AI, where, where much more of it's on these low power devices than uh, in the cloud. And so there, there's urgency there. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's just that the, the time at which the, the silicon will be available to do that is slightly longer than the time at which NVIDIA is pushing out the stuff it's pushing out right now. So, so urgency across the board, don't be mistaken. Uh, in terms of what's going on, there are two things happening in artificial intelligence right now. The first is that the technology industry, it was kind of getting boring. It was kind of getting stale. You know, we were doing digital transformations for 10 years that weren't really working. You know, what was going to happen next? We had, you know, Zoom came out. That was pretty good. Um, but there wasn't really something pushing the industry forward. There wasn't something pushing venture capital forward. And yet we were seeing much more interest in investing in venture capital from family offices and so on and so forth. So part of what's happening right now, what's happening today is speculation. I mean, NVIDIA has no chip fab, it has no ability to make its stuff. It has a cool design, um, but it's also got like a sports car, right? At some point, someone's gonna come up with a nicer sports car. They don't have the physical capital to differentiate their business. They're gonna have a problem. And a lot of companies, SMIC, uh, TSMC, probably on the back end, Apple, Intel, all making moves to get into NVIDIA's space. So you look at these in the, 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 the multiples right now, they're highly speculative. The second piece you were asking about is what do we do now? So, so investors are speculating right now is what's happening. That's why these are this is happening. Uh, the, the second question you asked is, what can I do right now? What do I need to do right now? So I was just talking with CEO, CIOs, rather, chief information officers of, of companies from around the world yesterday. And what we're hearing is a shift from uh, this is theoretical to this is a thing we need to look at. We don't yet have a business case for it. Um, and we, we are not yet getting the pressure from our C-suite, but we know it's coming. So that's, that's what's happening. What I think people are missing is that the shift of what becomes possible when one person can do 100 hours of work in three by leveraging all of the information that would have been lost in the rest of the organization, right? That shift requires a cultural change. It's not just a technological change. And so what we're seeing, what you can do is figure out, okay, how you're going to drive that cultural change along with the technological shift in your organization. Because none of the things I've talked about today are things uh, that you can't do today. They're, they're switches you can flip uh, in your organization, literally as we speak and tools like Slack and tools like Otter and tools like uh, Zoom. Uh, we use a tool within our organization called Pixel Mixer, tools like Zapier. And the technology for small to medium-sized business is there today. It's, it's, it's not a, a technology stack shift. It's, it's a willingness to make the cultural shift, to make the process shift, uh, to do this. And for leaders, a willingness to, to give up control to gain uh, to gain performance. Thank you. 
how, how many AIs uh, will be eventually? Uh, um, okay, we, we know that there is whole big companies, uh, uh, especially those who are running uh, cloud uh, uh, computing services uh, are in, and they create their own their own AIs. But Elon Musk, who doesn't have a business in cloud uh, in cloud services, still, as far as I know, uh, also also creates a, its own AI. How, how many will be actually? Uh, uh, what we are speaking about? We are speaking about the population of uh, of hundreds, dozens, uh, or, or, or millions. Uh, or, or, or what it is. So, so when we think about this, you know, the inevitable thing that happens is that you have these deep foundational models, right? This is what OpenAI is making. This is what Anthropic, their their products, it's called Claude, is making. Uh, Stability AI. This is what they're making. These are deep foundational models. Uh, the next level up is the customized information that we're going to put on this, or more likely, industry specific tuning that will go on this. There will be a lot of those. There will be one for, for, for agriculture. There will be one for manufacturing. There will be one, so on and so forth. On top of that are maybe the segment specific models uh, or, or your company's individual models. So when we take a look at what's going on here in these layers of abstraction, you know, what we're seeing is you know, that there are I forget what it is. I think China's got 19 large language models today. They're screwing around at the foundation level um, and, and at that, that first level of abstraction. Uh, when you take a look at Hugging Face, which is a company that deals with open, uh, open source large language models, um, uh, they, they have on top of them uh, open source things that other people are selling. I think there are like 500,000 of them right now. So, so the reality is we need to talk about what level of abstraction we're talking about here, because when you look at open AI on its own, eh, it's okay, it's useful, it's fun to talk to. You take open AI, or I use a tool called Claude, which was made by Anthropic, and you put your book and everything you've ever written and all of your video transcripts into it. And you say, what do I know about this question? It becomes a completely different conversation, right? And so as you move up these layers of abstraction, what you get is much, much more useful information. And so we need to just figure out where we want to play and how we want to win within this. Yeah, okay, but I understood that the foundation, there will be just a few. I, 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 because I, it, it costs dozens of billions to create anyway. <laughs> now, right now there will be just a few. Right now, AI is very centralized. Right, so okay. it's sitting on cloud services. It's very energy intensive. It takes a lot of compute right now. Um, and so there will only be a few of those and, and Amazon will pick a winner. Google will pick a winner. Microsoft will pick a winner. And, and whoever owns the data centers in China will pick a winner. And you don't have the consolidation of data centers in the same way in, in, in Europe, um, but there will be some combination of those probably probably uh, American based companies uh, that that uh, are lead investors in those AI tools in in, in Europe. I, I'm not super convinced on Mistral because you know as as, as happened in the history of business and happened in the history of the of of the Earth also that uh, you know um, if something big appears, um, uh, it's becoming sometimes too big to exist. Uh, mm -hmm. How big, big company could be on us, uh, in your opinion? Well, because you at the moment we have additional, additional reasons for big companies, the biggest company on the earth to keep growing. You know, it happened only a half and a half or less than two years ago when, you know, Microsoft and, uh, and Apple, Apple was the first, uh, uh, you know, became more expensive than half market cap was about 1 trillion. Now, nobody speaks that uh, Microsoft has about 3, three trillions uh, market cap uh, and, and, you know, and et cetera. So how, how big could it be until uh, as, as, and other forces will start uh, will start uh, uh, making, uh, uh, interfering into this process because it could happen easily. Well, well, I think within this, there's a second question. So, uh, 
we we moved away from gold based currency in the 1960s 1970s and uh as a result it became possible to print monopoly money as a result we've had much lower uh um many less recessions depressions in the west uh since then uh many less months of recession depression in the west since then um the the point here is that with the pandemic we printed a lot of monopoly money and it's got to go somewhere and where we don't want it to go is into the actual consumer economy we need it up in the speculative economy we need it to stay in the financial economy so there's a lot of money up there. It's got to do something. So we can look at a company like Microsoft. We can look at a company like Amazon. We can look at a company like NVIDIA and say, well, you know, they're worth a, a $3 trillion. And I have no idea what their price earnings ratio is right now. But that means they've got to be the size of like a <laughs> mid-sized company by 2040. How is that going to happen? I, I'm sorry, mid-sized country by 2040. How is that going to happen? Uh, I have no idea. I don't have an answer for you, which suggests that this is speculation and this is putting money up there so that it doesn't go down into the consumer economy. That's what we're trying to do with that money. No, but, but this I understand. Sorry, interrupting you. This I understand. I'm not. I'm not. I, I've, I have not asked about the money uh, right. uh, value. I asked right. about the uh, real value of the company. Microsoft becoming is becoming and became uh, too big in all aspects, not only in the experts of the three billions uh, uh, um, uh, market uh, evaluation. For example, uh, let's give an example from the news of uh, yesterday or today. Even you know Microsoft sees providing uh, services uh, to Russia, mm -hmm. which makes us happy, as you know, in Ukraine. It should have happened a couple of years ago. But you know, the whole world is looking at this. Mm -hmm. Yes, and how long Microsoft will be allowed to uh, to 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 have such a power on the world? That was my question. I, I think the within this right, there's there's kind of a European versus an American perspective, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm uh, European. I'm I'm purely real European. I understand. Uh, and, and and I think there are two questions there, right? Like one, how do you tax these guys, uh, and how do you extract value from them, uh, especially if if they are transferring value out of economies instead of creating new value within them, uh, uh, and we've got to make sure that they're creating new value in the economies. If that's the case, then who cares how big they get? The second that they start being extractive, then, then we've got to start regulating. Um, I think, you know, you haven't asked this, but I look at the, the new EU AI regulations and I, I think they're basically guaranteeing that there won't be a leader in AI in Europe through, okay. through the regulation. So the question you want to actually ask is, you know, within Europe is, is that acceptable? Is, is this temporary human rights uh, uh, performance uh, worth the fact that you won't actually have a say in what happens next? Well, we will go into a very different <laughs> other, other discussion if comparing to Europe, because the biggest companies Europe at the moment uh, is is not uh, de de doing nothing with with AI, uh, but but providing uh, very expensive uh, uh, drugs against opacity. You know that's that, that's that's another per, uh, another discussion. Uh, look on your website, I wrote that uh, your passionate about inventing a future worth inventing yes that's your worth and i like them very much but I, I i i decided immediately to ask you and there's also a question or, or let's say a mood in questions in, in from the audience um, why the future is not always as we like uh, and who invent or who does those which, which, uh, which you know, prevent us being being happy and liking this future. For, like making it particular. You you mentioned that you know the and it's right you know that AI even currently already uh, uh, making diagnosis better than doctors. Um, mm -hmm. And and though you also simultaneously mentioned that there is nothing threat, no, no 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 risk for doctors, I believe that there are risks for doctors as well, mm -hmm. because the 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 the, the economy works was work, work particularly, which would, could create a, a very particular future for at least a big part of the of the people, and they don't like it. Uh, so uh, 
what are other forces, let me reformulate in the following way, except of our willingness to create something good exist, which prevent us, prevent us doing uh, uh, and ha having everything is good. So I, I think there's within that there's a there's a separate question, which is what's good in the micro, what's good in the macro, mm -hmm. and and from from uh, you know kind of what perspective do you take on what good is? Is it a utilitarian perspective? Is it a humanist perspective? Um, so in the big picture, what I see is there are I think less than a thousand brain surgeons in India right now, and there are over a billion people. This math doesn't work. The idea that we're going to have tools for lower skilled people to maybe do brain surgery. This is really important moving forward. So from a future worth living, I think that's really important. I do believe that there will be issues with, uh, with, with labor. The, the question is, uh, at what rate does this change happen? And the second question is, at what um, uh, rate can skills be rebuilt or transferred? And so when you take a look at the digital revolution, you know, it took about 30 years from 1980 with the birth of the personal computer to about 2010 for that, for that whole cycle to happen. So there were people, you know, generations moving out of the workforce, generations moving into the workforce. It was painful for a lot of people, um, but it was a manageable thing. If that happens in 10, we have a very, very, very different world that we're looking at. The second thing that's going on when we think about building a future worth building is what are the demographics today versus say in 1980? You know, in, in Europe, we have structural labor shortages uh, among low skill labor, mid skill labor, high skill labor. It's creating structural labor issues in Europe. U.S., we have slightly better demographics across uh, India. India has great demographics still across much of Asia. We're going to start to see a graying out by 2040, which is going to be a bit of a challenge. South America already happening. So when we take a look at these technologies, what is a better future? It's, it's kind of like where and for who uh, and at what scale are the questions that I'm thinking about when you're when you're talking about that. So I, I don't know that I answered your question. No, no, I think I fully run around it. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Just uh, you know, all, all this all these discussions are, are, are worthwhile. You know, uh, um, somehow somehow digest <laughs> because it is not it's not easy. All, all everything simultaneous. So all your thoughts are very much appreciated. Uh, we have only a few minutes left, and I can't why ask a question. Also from your from I have your to side, I, I I learn. Minutes, if there's something something in the chat too. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I learned that you uh, develop a menu for Michelin star restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> and I I do hope that uh, it was without uh, AR assistance. But if you can share this uh, uh, this this, this uh, event uh, somehow with us, will be will be just great. So, how, how could it happen? How could you simultaneously be in such a different fields? Um, so there's work. There's work and there's hobbies. Um, uh -huh. You might have noticed that my brain is kind of like that bowl of spaghetti that I was talking about in the the PowerPoint presentation. It's just like, I God God bless you for choosing to get inside of that for an hour. Um, but the way I, I've learned how to organize my thoughts, organize my operations is actually through cooking. When you cook a 12, 20 course meal it is incredibly operationally rigorous. You have to time things, have hundreds of components, you know, ingredients coming in to the, the, the kitchen at just the right time, processed in just the right order to get them out at just the right time to the, uh, to, to the restaurant. And so that's kind of my hobby is I hang out in my friend's restaurants and, and work with them. Uh, I ran a food innovation firm for a number of, for, for a number of years as well. Uh, and one of the things we did was actually use AI to look at the gases coming off of food, what are called volatile organic compounds. If you think about drinking wine and you drink wine and you hold your nose, it just kind of tastes sour, like lemon juice. Uh, when you release your nose, it, starts tasting like wine. That's all the gases coming off of it. So we used AI to understand what was going on in food. What are those gases and, and what might be interesting together? 
And we actually came up with a whole range of, of really interesting dishes uh, as a result of that. That's great. But I did believe that uh, uh, it, it is it, it, it AI, AI can cannot compete with people at the moment in this field because technology, as far as I remember, is from Greek is something like you no know, art to the practice or something like this. <laughs> so, and I do hope uh, that we shall still have some fields where art, you know, human related art, uh, will be put in the practice and bring people um, uh, pleasure, uh, like in a Michelin, Michelin star restaurants. And you, uh, with this. And, uh, and the time clicking, uh, I uh, have only a few seconds to uh, thank you very much, uh, um, um, Jonathan, for, for your being present here. We are looking forward to welcome you in Kiev and uh, learning about how to uh, uh, resolve uh, 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 our troubles and our problems. Uh, uh, and um, uh, it will be a great pleasure for us to meet in, in Kiev. And all the participants, uh, I remind that uh, our project is going on and is scheduled for the third Wednesday of the month. So check with your uh, calendars uh, and join uh, uh, MIM Kiev uh, website in the third Wednesday in, uh, in April. And with this, once again, uh, it was a, a great pleasure to and an honor to have you uh, with us these days. And uh, with all the best regards, uh, goodbye. Thank you. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective, and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com.